Today's project is this Ford F700 flatbed truck. It has a 429 or 7 liter gasoline engine. He says that it has a pretty significant exhaust leak, possibly from the exhaust manifolds. It has a bit of a misfire, kind of runs rough, and there's some electrical problems. The fuel gauge doesn't work, and some of the various lights don't work. Yeah, there we go. Here at Watch West Work, we do the job right because we do the job twice. I found the misfire. Very few of the lights do work. Let's put it that way. Every single wire splice is just twisted and taped. I don't know. It can be hard to hard to feel a misfire, single cylinder misfire on an eight cylinder engine. Plus, I mean, this ain't exactly a Duesenberg. So it definitely has a hesitation off of idle. But it is still cold. And then I noticed it has a hard time coming back down. Down to idle. It'll hang there about 1200 RPM for for a long time before it shuts back down. Don't know. Anyway, let's see if we can wedge it back in the shop. So, the clutch is really funky on this thing too. That should be first gear. <laughs> Guess the mirror's broken. And the backup alarm works. What do you know? Target here. You think with a twenty two foot wide door, it wouldn't be so hard to get a truck in here. But then again. Well, the customer told me that he replaced the spark plug wires and the engine ran better for a little while and then the misfire came back. So it's pretty obvious what happened. Because this exhaust manifold was loose, the exhaust gases were blowing right up onto the spark plug wells and the old heat shields weren't in very good shape and it's melted the boots. So this one is all coming apart. There's the conductor right there. And then this last one back here, what would that be? Cylinder number eight. It's completely destroyed. So it needs another new set of spark plug wires and that should take care of the problem. And we've got new heat shields and the manifolds are tight so we shouldn't have that problem again. I actually ripped the connector out of that wire when I tried to unplug it. So anyway, that should take care of that. No, no complex secondary ignition diagnosis on this one. Just a, just a visual inspection. I can't get the right spark plug wires until tomorrow. And I don't have any old ones laying around here. I thought for sure I did, but I can't find any. I do have a new set of spark plug wires from a point style ignition. Might be able to just kind of MacGyver this together for testing purposes. We'll just wrap the wires around each other and kind of tuck this out of the way. Beautiful. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Well, it's running a lot better, but now it won't idle down at all. It's stuck at about 1500 RPM. So I don't know if something's going on with the IAC or if it's got a bad coolant temperature sensor or a bad map sensor. I should better try to put the scanner up and see what it says. Well, I'm trying to talk to this old truck, which is 
always an adventure with OBD-1. I think I have all the right adapters for the snap-on scope. Those are the old adapters for the, the old Modus that I had. And then I have a new adapter that converts it to OBD-2 so I can use the regular cord because the old data cord doesn't work with the whatever. Power adapter's hooked up. I can't get any codes out of it with the key on, key on engine off self-test. Also, I have no check engine light. It should be this one right here. It says check engine. And I just pulled the bezel back. And the bulb is busted. So, I don't know if that bulb being burned out could prevent me being able to read the codes. I think it might. So, I gotta fix that. We're in. There's the socket. There's what's left of the old broken bulb. And wouldn't you know, I actually have a 194 bulb in stock. Yeah, yeah it's still not working. It just hangs on this screen. Won't read any codes. So something else is wrong. Okay, folks, it's a new day. I threw in the towel last night. I just wasn't getting anywhere. Anyway, if we can get this thing to communicate, we should be able to see live data, just like OBD2. But that brings us to the next problem, which is that I cannot communicate with the PCM under any circumstances. I even tried the old school method where you short the self-test input here to ground, and it's supposed to flash the codes out on the check engine light, and it does not. Now the check engine light does work. When you turn the key on, the light comes on. And when you start the truck up and run it, the check engine light comes on. So something's able to turn that on. I believe it gets power from the key switch, and then the PCM pulls it to ground. But interestingly enough, if I check this pin right here in the data link connector, it will not power a test light. So somewhere between, I don't know, between the PCM, this splice, and the data link connector, that connection is broken. Or something else is grounding the check engine light besides the PCM. Not really sure what's going on there. It doesn't really make any sense. If it can turn this light on, it should be able to turn a test light on here. So anyway, that's where I'm at with it right now. It seems to run good since we have switched those plug wires around that got rid of the hesitation off of idle, but it won't come down in idle. The idle won't come down. It stays at about 15, 1600 RPM, and it gets worse the more it warms up. So. Yeah, something is wrong, but we can't figure it out because we don't have any communication. I checked a few other things. There's a ground here in the data link connector that's also a ground for all of these sensors. That is good. There's a power feed here that also feeds the coil side of the fuel pump relay. That is good, and the fuel pump relay runs. So I don't know where we're going to start. I mean, obviously the PCM is doing something because the engine runs. But for whatever reason, we can't talk to it and there's something, something crossed up in this circuit. Now why that would stop it from spitting out the codes on the check engine light? Anyway, I don't know, but we're going to find out. <laughs> well, I decided to remove the computer, the PCM, from its little holder here underneath of the dash and looky what I found it's another data link connector and another self-test input uh... okay so now I have to figure out if these are hooked together in parallel some way they go into different harnesses so this one that I uncovered goes right into the PCM harness the other one goes I don't know where it goes. <sighs> anyway, that one looks pretty crusty. I see some green nasties in there. But let's uh, let's try this one and see if we can talk to it. <laughs> yeah, we've uh, we've got codes. Pulled them up, no problem. So looks like about what we expected engine coolant temperature sensor out of range intake air temperature sensor out of range and then there's some evap stuff that probably isn't going to get fixed but 
Yeah, that's kind of what I suspected. It acted like it had a bad coolant temperature sensor. So in a fuel injected engine, your, your coolant temperature sensor is kind of like your choke control. So when the engine's cold, you know, it's harder for the fuel to combust because, you know, the cylinders are cold and whatever. So it changes the air fuel mixture ratio a little bit, just like having the choke on to make that work. And then as the engine warms up, it should back that off. But if the coolant temperature sensor is stuck high, no, stuck low, it's never going to let the idle come down. So <sighs> that was the trick finding the right data link connector. <sighs> I don't even want to tell you guys how much time I spent yesterday trying to figure this out. Anyway, let's move on. Let me show you guys what I found under the hood. I think it's going to provide some answers. This is a capillary tube for an old school mechanical coolant temperature sensor that somebody's added into the side of the dash. And if you follow it down there into the intake manifold, and then you back up a little bit, you'll see this connector that is connected to nothing. So I have followed the wires or kind of traced the wires back so it's got a green with a yellow stripe. If you go down to the computer and check for a green with yellow stripe, it lines up with pin 7 which is supposed to be the engine coolant temperature sensor input. So there is no engine coolant temperature sensor and it's no longer connected to the ECM. Don't know why, but that's definitely a problem. Now the intake air temperature sensor should be that guy right there, which actually goes right into the intake. And if you follow the, it's got a red wire, if you follow that back to the ECM, it does indeed correspond to the pin for the intake air temperature sensor. So what I'm thinking we do is we tap into this connector with a potentiometer or a decade box or something and try to fake a resistance value and see if we can make the engine run, run better with a, a substituted you know, value for the coolant temperature sensor. Here's our test setup. I'm back probed into the connector and then I hooked up this little potentiometer. This comes with the AES Wave U-Test terminal kit. Fantastic kit. And this is a 10K potentiometer. I can adjust it all the way from 10K ohms down to basically zero. And we're all the way at maximum right now, 10K ohms. That's the live data on the scan tool. Watch what happens when I turn the potentiometer here. We're slowly climbing. Climbing, 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 climbing. Up to about 180, that should be about the ideal. So that's the plan. We'll start it up and we'll tweak that pot until we get to where we want to be and see if it helps our idle. I may not want to start because of the sensor. I may have to unplug it. Well, the idle's already lower than it was yesterday. Let's see what happens. I just went into closed loop. I don't know if we have a long-term fuel trim on this or not. Oxygen sensors are switching. Seems like the idle or the intake air temperature sensor is working as well. It's up to 55. And it's really not any better. It's still about 1400 RPM. The IAC is completely unplugged right now, the idle air control. So I think that's where we're headed next. Well, shucks. I thought we were onto something with that coolant temperature sensor, but it doesn't seem to be a, really any better. So the idle air control is this 
gizmo right here. Let's see if we can clean that or something. Let's get it out of there and at least have a look at it. Boy, that's hard to film. All right, you're looking inside of the idle air control right now. This is the little spool that moves back and forth to opens and closes, lets air in and out. Now it powers off right now. I've got it hooked up to a bench top power supply, but check this out. I can move that probably a good millimeter before it actually hits the seat. So that doesn't seem right. Let me turn on some juice here. So you can see it moves over proportionally. It's duty cycle controlled, which we can approximate just with the varying voltage. So there's 13 volts right there. That should be fully open. Down to zero volts right there, which should be fully closed but it's not fully closed. It still has another millimeter to move. So I don't know if that's a problem or not. I don't know enough about them. Kind of think I might just order one and we'll compare this one to the new one. And if it looks the same, we'll put it back together. If it's different, we'll replace it. All right guys, it's way past what should be the end of the day, but I want to circle back to this F700 truck. There's something that we're missing and I don't know what it is, but I've been thinking about it. So we went after these first two codes, the engine coolant temperature, oil temperature circuit high, or the intake air temperature out of range, whatever those codes were. We chased those and it didn't get us where we wanted to go. And then I got into this goose chase with the, the IAC, the idle air control and all that jazz. I don't think that's the problem. So what I'm thinking is we focus maybe on these other two codes. The canister purge valve fault and auxiliary canister purge valve fault or whatever it said. And the reason I'm thinking that is, you know, a, a simple vacuum leak would explain all the problems that we're seeing. This is a, a speed density engine. It uses a map sensor instead of a, you know, a ma manifold absolute pressure sensor instead of a mass airflow sensor, a MAF. So if it has a big vacuum leak, all it does is raises the idle. It doesn't affect the fuel trims. And I could see in the data that the fuel trims were, were pretty reasonable. So yeah, let's, uh, let's go to the truck. I'll show you what I've maybe found. Over here on the right side frame rail, there's some vacuum and emission stuff. These two cans here are vacuum reservoirs. At least I'm pretty sure they are. Back here, are the charcoal canisters. So this is for your evap system. These trap the emissions for the evaporative emissions from the fuel tank. And one of these hoses goes to the fuel tank and the other one should go to the evap purge solenoid. So the purge solenoid opens to allow the vapors from the canister or from the fuel tank to be sucked into the manifold and burned like any other kind of fuel. So that part of the EVAP system looks fine. But if we come up here on top of the engine, things don't look so good. I'll try to get you guys in here. This, I believe, is the purge solenoid. Now there should be two of them side by side. And here's the plugs for them, both disconnected. And the lines that come off that purge solenoid are cut. Or they've dissolved or something. Anyway, where I'm going with this is if you follow this big fat hose here, that comes from the charcoal canister and it goes right in the back of the intake manifold. And I don't think there's any kind of valve in that line. So that could be a problem, right? Uh, I think so. So I guess what I'm thinking, we'll put everything back together, you know, the IAC and all that stuff back together. And I'll just take some pliers and pinch that hose off and we'll see what happens to the idle. I think we might be on to something.
All right, I've had enough for today. Tomorrow, we're gonna figure out how to, how to fix that purge valve, and we should be done with the engine. The only thing left at that point is to fix a few lights, maybe replace the uh, coolant temperature sensor if we feel, feel so inclined, and then we gotta investigate why the fuel gauge doesn't work. But we're getting there. Good morning. The next puzzle we need to solve is the fuel gauge. Customer says it doesn't work at all. Actually, the only two gauges that I know work is the tack, and I think the amp meter works. I haven't driven it, so I don't know about the speedometer. But for sure, these three don't work. Fuel, temperature, and oil. Now, somebody's already installed a mechanical temp and oil gauge, but the fuel gauge, you know, it'd be nice if that would work. However, the fact that they all three don't work, I think points us in kind of a direction. Now, like I said, I don't have an actual wiring diagram for this F700 truck, but I think it works more like this wiring diagram, which is from a 1985 Ford F350. And if you look here, all the gauges share a common power feed, except on ours, the tachometer does not. Ours has a four wire tach, so it's, it's different than this. But the three dummy gauges here, they get power on this blue, or no, sorry, black with the light green stripe wire. It's some kind of a resistor wire. And then there's a linear voltage regulator of some kind. And, or, or maybe it's just a voltage divider, I don't know. Some kind of a regulator here that supplies power to all three of those gauges. So I took the cluster out. And I did some poking and some prodding. The gauges are over here. This is the big bulk connector that provides all the connection to the gauges. And I checked for power here. And it's that wire right there and it's good. I also checked for the ground, which would be represented by this little ground. And it's on this wire here and it's good. So I think we have a bad voltage regulator and it's this little unit right here. Here's a real quick test of this voltage regulator. I got my power supply hooked up, feeding her, I don't know, 11, 12 volts, somewhere in that range. And if I stick the test light on the output side, that's what it does. It gives me a Morse code signal here. So that's no good. Yeah, plus the output doesn't seem to be constant. So it's not regulating in any way. Yeah, needs a new one. All right, here's the test setup. The instrument panel's back loosely in the truck and I connected that big bulk connector for all the sensors, or the gauges, I should say. And then I've clipped on to the ground and the output side of that voltage regulator. And I hooked that up to my benchtop power supply, which is putting out five volts DC. I know it's dark. Hope you guys can see. The fuel gauge is showing empty right now, but I know it's got about half a tank of fuel. So we have to keep in mind that this is still a, a 90s Ford, so most likely the sending unit doesn't work, but I'm gonna jump the I'm gonna short the wires on the sending unit and we're gonna watch the gauge. And it does indeed come up to full. Same test but with the oil pressure gauge, I'm gonna short it to ground. There we go. So those two work. I don't know about the coolant temperature gauge because I don't know where the wiring for that sensor is. I mean, we could jump it right at the harness, I guess. You know, at the back side of the cluster. So this is where the oil pressure gauge would normally live. Should be right there. Instead, they've removed it and installed this little tube for the mechanical gauge. So if we want to fix that, we're going to have to redo that. This is the wire. It was just laying, laying here. So that's the wire that should have gone on the sending unit. <sighs> Wish I could find that coolant switch. I just, I don't know where it is. I have no idea. Ah, I was right. There is another switch for the coolant, the coolant temperature gauge. It's right there, way down underneath there, underneath the, almost underneath the distributor. It actually is underneath the distributor. Anyway, I've got it shorted to ground. Let's check that gauge. Here we go. 
Uh, why you no work? All right, hold on. What do you think, pup? I know, it's probably lunchtime, isn't it? Yeah, we'll go in a minute. I pulled the cluster apart. The coolant temperature gauge, I guess, is bad. If I jump power across those two terminals, it doesn't do anything. So, we're getting quite a list of things we need to really fix this truck. Needs a fuel sending unit. Needs the coolant temperature gauge. This guy right here. Needs a voltage regulator for the cluster. Those EVAP solenoids. The two wire coolant temperature sensor. An oil pressure switch. And I still haven't figured out why it doesn't have any backlights on the cluster. That's also broken. Uh, the switch is good. I pulled it out. It seems to test okay. So I don't know. I'm going to see what's available. Alright guys, I made a trip to the big city. I had to get my forklift propane tanks recertified. And while I was there, I stopped at the junkyard and I picked us up a new cluster. Well, used cluster. And then this is, this is for a Chevy Trailblazer. It's not related to our project. It had a broken broken nipple for the PCV valve. Do you believe that GM has obsoleted this part? They made zillions of those trailblazers. He said they had a, a handful of them throughout the country in dealer stock and once those are gone, that's it. Anyway. I have a set of purge valves with the fittings. I wasn't sure how that was arranged because we only had one on the truck to go from. I have a used 50 gallon tank sending unit that they say works. It's out of a 93 F700. And two oil pressure switches. Hopefully one of them works. I'm just going to test this little voltage regulator. Uh, it doesn't work quite like I expected. Yeah, that seems to be how it works. It just flashes. I wonder if it actually is just a flasher. Interesting. So it's kind of like super primitive pulse width modulation. <laughs> I don't know. Guess we'll hook it up and see if it works. Yeah, I'm just I'm not familiar with this system or how how it's engineered. All right, got the cluster put back together and installed, and it seems like it's working. See the fuel gauge there; it's reading about three quarters of a tank, and that's with the new or the junkyard sending unit. So I think we're going to be good to go. It's weird; you can see the gauge just kind of pulse every time that that, <laughs> that regulator flashes. Yeah, maybe that's a, maybe that was a common way that they used to do things. I don't know. This is, you know, I was nine when this truck was built and I wasn't even alive when it was designed. So who knows? <laughs> this is the original sending unit out of the truck and it actually works if you put an ohm meter on here and then move the arm. The resistance does vary from 72 to 10 ohms or whatever it's supposed to be but uh, check this out watch the float this is solvent I'm at the solvent tank uh, yeah she goes down like the Titanic compare that to the replacement so there's your problem it's got a bad float also, fun fact, you cannot remove the sending unit without sliding the fuel tank out. So, not a big deal on this truck because it's, it's not, not that rusty. Just loosen the straps and slide her out. But if you're working on a rust bucket, you're taking a risk anytime you remove those fuel tank straps because a lot of times that's the only thing holding the fuel in them. There we 
we go. Just like so. Now, if I look at the connector, that should tell me how it's supposed to be indexed. I think it goes. It goes just like that. And these bolts have little rubber seals on the bottom of them. That are supposed to seal this, this thing up. Anyway, not much to it. Get these purge valves liberated from this crusty old hose. Yes, I am wearing gloves. This stuff is horrible. I got some on my hands the other day. I was at the junkyard and it does not come off. Well, both of these purge solenoids are bad. The panels are stuck in both of them, which yeah, it's probably not surprising. They've been sitting, they were sitting exposed for who knows how many years. The hood was off the truck. So we'll have to have some new ones. At least I can use the fittings. And they didn't charge me anything for these anyway, so no loss. Well, how's that for overexposed? All right, guys, I think today is the day. There is a mysterious bright yellow circle in the sky, which I can't remember ever seeing before. It's warm, probably be the last chance we get to work with the door open this year. And I believe we have the last of the parts for the Ford F700, which is good because it's been here for a long time and I'm ready for it to, to go back home. So let's get to it. All right, we got one NGK coolant temperature sensor. And we've got two broke wind delivered purge valves. They are proud of these things. I think they're north of $60 a piece. Anywho, here's the elbows that we salvaged from the old purge valve setup. I've stuffed on some new flexible lines, just using fuel line. And it's kind of tricky. This is I think five sixteenths or three eighths, and this is quarter inch. And the yeah, I ended up having to just heat those and use a little bit of soap and shove the thing together. Now these are marked, which you probably can't see, but it says engine with an arrow pointing that way. So we need to make sure we get them in installed the right way. There it is. That's the purge valve setup for this truck. It's kind of hokey. It's just the same exact purge valve that's used on every other Ford from this, from this vintage. They just doubled it up so they could have twice the capacity. I guess we could install these rubber sleeves. I don't know what the purpose of them is, but can't hurt. I think the game plan on the coolant temp sensor is to keep the original, not original, the added on manual coolant temp gauge and oil pressure gauge, and we'll just tee them in with the the sensors that are supposed to be there. Kind of a belt and suspenders approach. So, we got a T here. This is 3 8 pipe for the coolant, quarter inch for the oil pressure. So the oil pressure one's no problem. But the coolant sensor, so you install this little bung and then there's a probe that goes down into the coolant. And I don't know if we're gonna have enough room for it to fit inside this T without hitting the other sensor. Well, the oil pressure switch worked out just fine, but the water temperature, not so much. Where is it? It's down there somewhere. Uh, there it is. You can just see the top of it. There's there's not enough room for this T to to spin in there. It hits the fuel rail or something. So I don't know what I could do with that. I could put an extension pipe up, I guess and mount everything up higher off the intake. Or possibly we could try to tap into one of those fittings coming out of the thermostat housing. So I guess we'll just leave this stuff here unhooked and if the electronic gauge ever fails, they can hook up the, you know, reinstall that capillary tube and have a mechanical gauge. There's the purge valves installed and connected. All I had to do was just chop that big hose that ran from the canister to the manifold in half and then attach it to either end of those Y's and that'll work just fine. The bracket was in good shape. I think we're out of stuff to fix. 
Let's fire it up, see what it does. So the idle won't come down until it warms up a little bit. Oil pressure gauge is working. Fuel gauge is working. Uh, it's warming up. It says it's 146 Fahrenheit coolant temperature. Dash gauge is starting to come up. Oil pressure gauge working. Fuel gauge working. I think it says it's charging. Looks like it anyway. And the RPMs have finally come down. So yeah, we're, we're looking good guys. It, it's running pretty good. And it's still an open loop. Running 11% on the fuel trim. There we go, it just switched to closed loop. And it looks like the, the sensors must be in control of the fuel trims now. It was probably a substituted value before. So that's good. Yeah, it had to get to 150. Must have been the magic number to go to closed loop. Yeah, we're down to 700 RPM. And the O2 sensor is switching now that we're in closed loop. That hesitation off idle is gone too. I don't know if this is normal, but I left it idling for about five minutes and it went to open loop. I hit the gas pedal and it went right back to closed loop. So I don't know why it would do that or what the strategy is. Not that familiar with OBD1. There it is. Must have gone back to open loop. Sure did. Wonder why it does that. I mean, it doesn't matter, but I thought at steady state it should say in closed loop. I don't know if you guys care about this or not, but I'm just going to show you another example of why. Why it's tough working alone. I'm trying to put the fuse box back in place. The screws were all missing out of it. It was just kind of hanging there. So I've got a screw started there in the bottom, but I can't hold the thing in place and go on the outside and put the nut on. So what we're going to do is use this tool here, which is a telescoping hood prop made by Lyle Tools. And that will hold that screw for us while we start the nut. Huh? Not bad. All right, we got to put all this ECM garbage back together. See if we can figure this puzzle out. I think it goes like that. Oh, man. Yeah, that looks good. Put that in there. And then these relays that were just hanging out, I think they snap in here. There we go. And then there's this thing. I should have put on before I put that relay in there. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. Now, it has a holder over here for the little data link connector. And I still, for the life of me, do not know why it has two data link connectors. So, somebody out there who knows Fords. Please tell me the answer. But I went ahead and labeled this one for the next guy. Who will probably be me. Because I don't... I don't even want to tell you guys how long I spent trying to figure that out. Stupid. Okay, now. This whole rigmarole should shove right up in there. Now this truck's a 94. It has live data. I think... 93 maybe or 92 was the first year for live data on the scan tool before you had live data if you wanted to measure a sensor value your only option was either to go out 
to the engine and unhook the sensor and measure it with a meter or back probe it and measure it with a meter. Or you could use a breakout board. So you had to undo this big connector here at the PCM and clip in a, a harness in kind of in line with this thing in series. And then it would have a big breakout board with all these different pin locations and you could measure values across those pins. And there would have to be big books that would tell you which pin did what on what model of car. It was not fun. But I've forgotten all that stuff now or possibly just blocked it out. Of course, before OBD2, it was the Wild West. You know, everybody had their own idea. You still see those breakout boards on eBay and different places. Sometimes they get a lot of money for them. Beautiful. We'll leave this one kind of dangling until we're confident that we don't have any more codes. There we go. No faults present. That's what we want to see. Truck's got a bad case of Ford door. So I can set one code for the EGR valve. It says EGR valve not opening delta pressure feedback EGR. So we better do some testing on that. That's the problem. That's why you always do a test drive because as soon as you start fixing things, now the computer can tell you other things that are wrong. Sorry guys, the wind noise is probably gonna suck. So here's the EGR valve and it's got a connector on it. I don't know if that's a position feedback or if it's a pressure sensor or how it works, but it's vacuum actuated by this little solenoid right here. So we should be able to hook up a manual vacuum pump and see if the engine runs different when we try to open it. Okay, the EGR valve's definitely working. The problem is I don't think we have any vacuum here at the solenoid. Yeah, I got nothing. Must have a vacuum leak somewhere. I mean another vacuum leak somewhere. Well, there's your problem. These reservoirs are leaking, I guess. Okay. 
So those are obviously leaking somewhere. Uh, there's your problem. And there's your problem. I don't think that's going to work. As you probably already guessed, this vacuum reservoir, she's in pretty tough shape. I don't think we're going to be able to patch that up. It's probably gotten water in it at one point in time. So, it's junk. Luckily, from the local scrapyard, we have a replacement. Straight off the Campbell's soup production line, two new vacuum reservoirs. So the purpose of the vacuum reservoir is to allow you to use vacuum actuated accessories when you don't have vacuums. Remember the engine only makes vacuum at idle. When the throttle is open there is no vacuum. Also, you know, of course when you shut the engine off there's no vacuum. So if you wanted to open the EGR valve or shift the mode door on your HVAC controls or whatever, while you're at full throttle you need a little extra vacuum to get that done. So that's the only purpose. Now normally on a pickup truck or something you'd only have one, but just like everything else on this big truck, they doubled it up. There we go. Installed, plumbed up, ready to rock and roll. I went ahead and put both of them on because, you know, why not? And then I noticed the uh, canister here, charcoal canister, one of them's missing the vent cap. So that could be a problem. They're not really supposed to get wet. Anyway. Anyway. I think we're done. I'm gonna go for one last test drive, make sure that the check engine light doesn't come back on, and then we're gonna ship this bad boy out of here. Obviously it's later in the day. Wonder what's going on here. The gas station's closed. It's only seven o'clock. All right guys, I think that's it for real this time. Test drive went well. It's running like a million bucks. No check engine light on. Yeah, good enough. Well, there you go folks, how to fix your 1994 Ford F700 with the 429 gas engine. Probably a flat rate mechanic's worst nightmare. You can see why the last guy fixed it by just punching out the check engine light. <laughs> it was quite an adventure, but makes pretty good YouTube content. Uh, just to review, when the customer brought the truck, the list said exhaust manifold gaskets, fuel gauge doesn't work, uh, let's see, engine misfire, and quote, a few of the lights don't work. <laughs> so, yeah. All of these parts later, we finally got her fixed up. So, resurfaced the exhaust manifolds. The left side was cracked, the right side was loose. Slammed that back together, no big deal. Replaced the heat shields that were corroded through, or, or were, yeah, corroded beyond, beyond reuse. And then that led us to the engine misfire, which was melted boots on the spark plug wires, just from all the heat from that blown out exhaust manifold gasket. Then what? We got it running and it wouldn't idle down and we chased that coolant temperature sensor. Didn't get us where we wanted to go so we, we found the, the vacuum leak through the purge valves, replaced those. Then we still had problems with vacuum leaks and we found the corroded through vacuum reservoir canisters. Then the gauges, we had the bad voltage regulator and the bad coolant temperature gauge in the cluster. 
and we had whoa, float on the sending unit. Then we had to fix the lights. And I've seen some bad wiring, especially on trucks, but this one was pretty close to the top of the list. Anyway, the customer just picked up the truck. He gave me a big thumbs up. He's happy, I'm happy, and hopefully you're happy. So thanks guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.